Hi, how's it going? This is Resident of Collinwood for YouTube. I'm here to finally do a read along of To Be Down Big Al. Sorry for the delay, guys. Uh, things have just been crazy, busy, and hectic. Um, book 6, Chapter 4. Is it freedom or a trap? A dark sky covered the island of Welshport like a blanket of deep purple haze with polka dot stars. Uh, scattered across it at Fatima's house in the village. Mary, Charlotte, and Morgan continued to push for answers on why Fatima was hiding the injured Philip. Charlotte knew the answer. Her mind was able to tap into the energy around her at Fatima's. Oh, Loba da Lua, Charlotte said to a shock room. What did you say, Fatima asked, and the young girl spoke in Portuguese. Charlotte, Mary replied, equally as stunned. What? What's happening, Morgan whispered. The moon wolf, Fatima then replied, translating for Charlotte who felt just as confused as anyone else. Down in the small basement they had been that or sorry that had been converted into a bedroom. Philip could hear talking. He held tight to his bandage and injured body, wounds that were ripped into his flesh by a vicious and hungry wolf from the foggy forest on Good Island. He moaned in pain as the shabby stitches holding his flesh together stretched and squeezed the wound. Philip's heart pounding, or sorry, pounded in his chest as he made his way up the wooden staircase barefoot and limping. His large feet felt each and every grain of splinting wood. In incredible detail. Instantly his mind knew the type of wood they were made at, of as if his feet were pulling the natural fibers into his body and showing him the exact tree the wood came from. As his senses were intensified he could smell his family in the other room as he slowly walked up the wooden steps he could hear each of their heartbeats as they were drums tapping in his brain he could sense them almost as if he were in the same room with them as he got to the top of the basement staircase he put his hand on the door and closed his eyes he could actually see them in his mind standing in Fatima's front room stop with your in intense superstitious you're frightening Charlotte and Morgan Mary said pulling little Caleb from Morgan's arms into hers but it's true Fatima insisted when Philip was attacked by that creature the monstrous ghostly thing in the woods it bit him. It took from him flesh and blood and bound them in a way that is unnatural. This will create something very dangerous for all of us in the coming days when the moon finally appears full in the sky. No, Mary dissented. That can't be true. The wolf wasn't normal, Morgan interjected to a stun room. He was just the one truly witness. He was the only true witness to what happened. Morgan fleed. Charlotte began hope, hoping to keep him from broaching the terrible memory of that night. Let me explain, Fatima added. Go on, Mino, she said using Portuguese word for boy. I wasn't Sorry, it wasn't normal. I saw it with my own two eyes. It was hollow and frightening and large. A wolf from a different breed. Something from a nightmare. It, it wanted to kill me. But Philip saved me. 
If I if it weren't for him, I'd be down in that basement suffering. The wolf I saw was not normal. It wants death and only death. Uh, Morgan added as Philip continued to listen to and watch his incredible, powerful mind. Morgan turned to Fatima, who nodded her head, encouraged him to continue to tell them what he saw and what he knew. He then turned back to Mary to explain. It, the wolf, seemed to be, uh, I don't know, almost searching for someone to pass this curse to, on to. He was larger than any wolf I had ever seen before. Its paws were massive, and the head was giant. And then it lunged at me. Philip jumped in its way. I swear it was almost as large as Philip. Behind the basement door, the iris of Philip's eyes suddenly began to change from light brown to a ghostly deep yellow and seemed to glow. His toes curled, uh, gripped the edge of the very last wooden step before the door. His hand that propped his healing seemed to or sorry, body up, curl to causing his sick fingers to twist downward and his fingernails to scratch long lines down the wood paneled wall. The truth of what happened to Philip and what was happening to his body was like a fire poker plunging deep into his mind. Flashes of the attack came across his mind. The wolf, Morgan, in terror, the high moon in the sky, dark forest, blood in the snow, and a howling to so deep, so furious it would turn anyone's blood ice cold <clears throat> it tore through Philip's body like it hadn't eaten ever Morgan continued the wounds were terrible Charlotte recalled after bandaging them herself then what can we do what can we do to stop him from suffering for whatever he's going to Whatever's going to happen to it when the moon is full, Mary asked, finally accepting the danger that was to come. As the four discussed the issue of Philip's fate, he let out a heart-stopping scream of pain, something that sounded like it was coming from a hurt animal trapped in some kind of iron vice. His mind was splitting. He was beginning the long process of transition into the moon wolf, the painful, uh, cruel process that began with his mind and would end with his sane body and further down the line of his process, possible death and destruction. Hearing this ungodly scream from the beyond basement door, a horrified Mary and Caleb to Charlotte and rushed over to the door's exterior lock. Philip, in pain, fell backwards down the small foot and stairs back down into the basement. Philip, uh, Mary shouted, hearing the man she loved uh, yelping in pain. She quickly began to unlatch the locks, but suddenly Fatima rushed over and put her hands over the, them, stopping Mary from finishing. Do not open this door, Fatima ordered. He's in pain. I will help him, but you cannot go down there. It is too dangerous, Maria. Mary narrowed her eyes and shoved Fatima away and quickly unlocked and opened the basement door. She stood at the top of the basement and looked down the dark stairwell but saw Philip's feet and legs laying sideways when he landed 
cloaked in the shadows of the room. He's hurt, Mary said softly. And she slowly made her way down, followed by a nervous fat. Oh, oh my God, Morgan whispered, his stomach turning where he stood away from the action. Are you all right? Charlotte asked her peer. Morgan nodded that he was, but in truth, all he wanted to do was run. Uh, yeah, I, I would too. Um, as Mary and Fatima got to the bottom of the stairs, they found Philip there breathing heavily with no shoes or shirt, only half covered in dark pants and large white bandages across his chest that were stained in his blood. He was sweating profusely. His heart was pounding in his chest. His body hair, Mary noted to herself, was visibly thicker. Mary knelt down next to him. He was covering his face with one arm. Philip, it's Mary. Did you hurt yourself? She asked him softly. I should slowly reach for his arm to move it, move it away from his face. No, Fatima said, grabbing Mary's arm. Don't touch. Mary yanked her arm out of Fatima's hand and touched Philip. Anyway, and when she did, a powerful surge of energy uh, filled her mind like a waterfall blasting large amounts of water into a lagoon. She saw the wolf. She saw bloody Josh and T. She heard screaming and dying. She heard howling and waves of crashing and more screams. Let go, Fatima shouted. Shouted. Fatima groaned. It's my cat's jumping on me as I'm reading this. Um, in pain, he as he too was seeing what Mary was seeing. Um, Mary fell backwards, her mind filled with these images of horror, her eyes wide and panicked, his feet and hands now in the light from the above floor showed signs of the transition um cats have been around what do we do um what do we do mary asked fatima realizing now how much danger philip was in even worse that he was even worse what he was capable of. Fatima lifted a brow and pointed over to the bed where Philip was laying. She reached for a shelf that was near her and picked up several long strands of heavy chains. We must constrain him before he fully transitioned. The moon is coming. Mary gulped and helped Philip to his bed. As he lay back, she put her hand on his bare chest, feeling the thick hairs grow thicker before her own eyes. Their eyes locked and she could see he was there. He was there, but there was something different. A darkness that was unnatural to Philip, true self. He looked frightened and then mouthed to her, I'm dying. <laughs> I'm sure that's what that feels like too, shit. Um, no, no, you're not dying, you're not, Mary replied, uh, hoping to reassure him. Philip began to speak through a soft, scratchy, weak voice. I need you to know that I love you, Mary. Uh, I love you with everything that I am. Um, whatever happens, Mary, Mary, I love you. Mary began to tear up. Her heart felt as if it was ripping in two. She loved him too with all her heart. She buried her head in his chest. I love you too, she said. Fatima came and began to chain him to the bed, a sight that disturbed Mary to, the end, to no end. I can't believe we are doing this, she said. 
Uh, we have no choice if we all want to live. We have, if we all want to be sure that no one on this island ever knows that this man is a monster, we need to be sure to keep him s safe in here in chains. It's the only way, Fatima said. They chained him successfully. He moved, and the chains chimed and clinked together loudly. He moaned as the change in his body grew stronger and stronger. Seeing Philip's agitation grow, Fatima quickly ushered Mary up the darkened stairwell and back up into the house. How is he? Can we see him? Charlotte asked. Fatima shook her head. We have to go, Mary replied with a tear-stained face. Mother, what is it? What happened? Charlotte asked in a deep worry. But what about Philip? How we have to help him, Morgan insisted. Morgan, we have to go. Now, we can't help him here. We'll find a way to help him, but it can't be here, Mary said as she pulled Caleb back from Charlotte's arms. Do not be foolish, Fatima replied. There is nothing we can do but lock him up here. Mary turned to Philip, biological mother, posing as his aunt, and seethed it with anger. She felt as if Fatima wanted Philip to be this way. Mary thought this was Fatima's odd way of doing but she never did, when he was a child, be there for him. Mary saw this as Fatima's needing this moment to somehow give back to Philip for all the years that they lost a long time, fam as long as family members uh, to Mary. This was selfish of Fatima for not attempting to help find a real solid solution to poor Philip's suffering. I will not allow him to transition into anything like what I saw in that vision. We cannot let it happen. Mary shouted in frustration, Philip will not kill anyone in any way, shape, or form. It's not in his nature. It's not who he is. Uh, but don't you see, child, this creature has changed every fiber of his good-natured heart. It's gone now. It need. It's not who Philip wants to be. It is who he has become, Fatima explained. Not, or sorry, no, stopping, no, stop saying that. Mary shouted, infuriated. She had already seen the disasters of what the supernatural world could do uh, to a person she cared for. Uh, she did not want it to happen again. Not this time. She's talked. Well, she's talked about a couple people there. One, she's talked about um, Sebastian. Um, so. Then, what do we do? Morgan asked meekly. I will protect him, Fatima. Uh, now, decides what do we want to help? Do you want to help me, or will you allow this mother to take Philip? Philip, uh, Philip with up when the full moon really rises. Fed him aside, uh, but said nothing. Just crossed her arms over her chest and defined. She believed she knew better for Philip. Um, oh, let's see what I got. Sorry, guys. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, Mary raised her eyebrow uh, and looked at Fatima with disappointment. No number of chains will contain him. 
he understand Fatima, nothing will contain him. Um, you are not powerful enough. Fatima sighed again. Don't be foolish with your actions, child. Fatima's rebuff was Mary's answer. She gathered the children and left Fatima's small home in the village with a patchwork plan in her mind to save the man she loved from turning into the monster that she saw. What are we going to do? Mary asked as the small family made their way back to the docks to return to their cottage on Good Island. Mary wasn't sure what to say, but answered cryptically, We're going to do all we can to save him, my darling. We have to. He saved me. He saved us. Now we save him. Mary's mind went straight to the only hope of salvation, her powers, and her mother Eliza's book of spells. Oh, shit! Um, <laughs> I say that with... I say that by... Uh, the saying, uh, shit can hit the fan when them people use it when, uh, when that book opens up. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, back inside the small home, Fatima closed the door and stared. Back at the basement, a single tear fell down her face. Nothing in her tarot cards would tell her how to get out of this. She could only wait on the folklore and time to show its face. She feared... Uh, Mary's unwillingness to let things progress naturally uh, would lead to everyone that undoing. Um, back, you know, back inside. Uh, oh, sorry, no. <laughs> yeah, I read that. Okay, so let's go real quick for the for this opening here. Mary has seen loved ones killed, so she doesn't want to lose another one um, to the supernatural world. Her mother, too, had a battle with the supernatural. Uh, and the next morning, Aurora and Evie sat on a small balcony having morning tea uh, over at Gregory Rain's home in Aurora. And now Evie was were staying. Evie couldn't bear to be part from her son, Gabriel, who was at Terrible House, whose legal entanglements were still being worked out. For now, Jacob and Celeste held their clutches tightly to their legal right of being the little boy's guardian at his and his money. For her part, Evie was in no way, shape, or form going to stay another day at Terramore uh, House with the Lord's family, despite her right to as Sebastian's widow and Gabriel's mother. Uh, Jacob's constant conniving the sh and the shadowy plots pushed her to fall far and uh, very memorable of what the old Caspian had plotted for her child to shield her to her core even now. This way, she felt safe in the home of the constable, even if it meant leaving little Gabriel for now. It hurt her deeply to leave him and only visit in the day, but it was all she could do for now. As to George, the two Jordan women drank coffee, their minds equally off on some foggy place, thinking of their children, a small black car, Pother up the cobblestone street in town below the balcony where Aurora and Evie were sitting. The car was instantly recognizable. It was Rebecca and her family driver, Aaron Hampstead. Aaron, a tall, golden bearded man with a top hat on covering his bald, quickly, bald head, quickly leaped from the driver's seat and dashed around the car to open the back door. For Rebecca to step out while his white gloves almost looked like they were uh, glowing in the modern sun. What in the world is this about? Aurora whispered from the third story balcony. And Rebecca lifted her eyes up towards where she heard Aurora's voice, the sun thinning her cool gray 
Oz Aurora Rebecca said pushing her hand to him for help up in the apartment steps. Evie took a breath and shot her mother a look of concern, her stomach muscles tightening over the what Rebecca might say or do during their, her unannounced visit. It only took minutes for Rebecca and Aurora and Aaron to get to the apartment, and as Rebecca lifted her hand to knock, Evie opened the door. Psychic powers, Rebecca joked. Evie smiled politely. We heard you drive up. Please come in, Miss Lord. Lord Cassador, Aurora said as she entered the room, rem reminding them all of Rebecca's new marriage. Uh, Rebecca smiled politely, but felt a twinge of Aurora's sarcasm and stepped in while Aaron went back and waited outside by the car. You can come in too, Aaron, Evie said kindly just before she, before he, sorry, before he vanished down the stairs. Uh, no, miss, thank you. I'll be all right downstairs, he replied. Stoically, ma'am, he added, dipping his head to Aurora. Who smiled back? Rebecca turned back to Evie from Aaron and smiled. He's working, she told Evie. Evie reminding her who was the queen in the room. What can we do for you? Rebecca Aurora asked as she motioned for Rebecca to join her uh, to sit. Congratulations on the marriage, by the way, Evie added. Even though I still have incredibly deep concerns about Caspian moving up in, oh, in with my son at Terramore House, she added. Thank you, my thank you, dear. I did hope you you wished us happiness. I can assure you, Evangeline, what Caspian did to us, Rebecca began, of all of us is in the past. I know it's hard to fathom that after everything, but as I promised you, Gabriel is safe. Yes, well, we can only hope Aurora answered her tone, still dripping with skepticism. My grandson is too precious, and he needs to be here with his mother safe and sound, not around a former demo, she paused. Uh, we just want everyone to be, Aurora paused again, happy, she said sarcastically. Thank you, Rebecca, replied, clocking Aurora's slight. But in truth, I didn't come for anyone's well wishes. I came to check on you both. I know that there hasn't been a lot of talking between us since all of our mutual tragedies, but I wanted to be sure you both knew that I was very much still the concerned grandmother of this family, Rebecca said. Or looked at a bro, a bro suspiciously. That's very kind of you. I can't blame you for your skepticism, Aurora. We both had a, a lot of history that I'm sure we'd rather forget. But as I mentioned to Evie a few nights back in Gabriel's room, I am determined to reunite her with her son and reverse everything Jacob has done in the past few months. I have a lot to clean up, and I will take full responsibility of what happened. Everything Aurora, everything Caspian's transgressions include, the poor man can barely remember his own life before he was, well, we all know what he was, Rebecca replied. Aurora turned to Evie, who had and filled in on her private conversation in Gabriel's room. It's true, Miss Thorcaster was kind enough to say she'd help me get Gabriel back, Evie confirmed. Aurora turned back to Rebecca. I won't sugarcoat anything, Rebecca. It's obvious that I still have a very difficult time trusting you. Actually, it's even made worse due to so since the marriage of Caspian. We all know what Caspian did to me. I want to assure you that he is different. I promise you this. Not a day goes by that 
man doesn't regret all the horrid things that happened while he was, well, in polite terms, take over, Rebecca answered, referring to Caspian's possession. How is he different, Evie said, now sitting next to her mother across from Rebecca. Our experiences at Churchill Green, the psychic ward, were unique. We found a way to come together after we realized what had happened to him, that he was just a victim of the creature inside of him, as I was, and as you were, Aurora, we were all subjects to some kind of possession. He was just far worse because it lived in him. I've had the challenge to see him in new light, and I do. He is no longer the thing, the monster. He's a person again. Or aside and grabbed Evie's hand, unsure what to believe. Evie looked at her mother and gave her a comforting smirk and squeezed her hand and signed that she believed Rebecca. I can't say that I am 100% fine with it, any of it, and I will steer clear of him, but it's your life, Rebecca. You can marry anyone you want. Just be careful, Aurora replied. My mother has been through hell and back, as we all have. You can understand that, Evie added. I can, Rebecca said with a smile. Believe me, I can. Now that there, now, there is something I wanted to do while I was here. All Evie wondered. Rebecca nodded and reached down to her purse at her feet and slipped her hand in, removing some golden rope with four keys tied to it. Fit perfectly into a fan shape in the palm of her leather-gloved hand. Benjamin, there... These are for you, and hopefully soon your son, Rebecca said. Evie and Aurora looked at each other, confused. What are the keys to, Evie asked. Go on, take them, Rebecca said. Evie complete, complied. Evie felt the cold metal of the keys in her hands as she inspected them, seeing each had laurel leaves engraved on the bow with the beautiful letter L in the center of the laurels. When David and Sabrina were married, my husband, Albert, had a home built on Belmore Beach, just above the North Shore Cliffs. David and Sabrina loved that home. It was theirs. They lived there, and it's where Sebastian spent his first three years of his life. Jacob, too, once. Had an eye for it. He courted Mary good. But we all know where that ended up, Rebecca explained, as she rolled her eyes at Jacob's past. Sebastian never mentioned it to me. He preferred Lockwood Thicket, Evie said, mentioning the cottage. Rebecca's family in the forest. Rebecca smirked. Well, he was a baby when he lived there. He may not have had the same connection as his... Summer is in the cottage, I imagine, too. It was too painful to go back to where there after everything. The beach is where his mother died. I see. That being said, and hoping you'll be able to see past the awful history, the hours, the house is yours. I'm giving it to you to keep for as long as you want to live there with whomever you want. Again, I promise you, Gabriel will be in your arms permanently soon. I'm still doing everything to make sure Celeste and Jacob loosen their grip. I just need to stop you there, Aurora interjected. Why should we trust you, Rebecca? You almost killed Gabriel. You were under my control before. How do we know you're not that way now? How do we know... This house on Belmore Beach isn't some kind of trap for my daughter and her son. It's not like this is a place she has ever been and, for that matter, even knew about. I have a big problem just believing you. You're absolutely right to question me. A good mother would. If there is something you want from me, anything to prove, 
but I am here for Eve and Gabriel, and I want nothing more than their happiness and to be together. I will give it to you. Name it. What can I do? Rebecca said, practically falling on her sword. Mother, please, Evie interject, interjected, trying to ease the tension building from Aurora's tone. Aurora took a breath and shook her head. I, I don't know, but I will say this. If even for a second, even for a split second, I see something that is amiss, and that your word of protecting Evie and Gabriel has faltered, I will come after you, Rebecca. Lord, I will make sure you are held accountable. This is not some kind of empty threat. It was a warning. I will not have anything happen to them, not again. Mother, Evie said again softly, it's okay. No, no, Evangeline, she is your mother. She's being protective. I completely understand, Aurora. Rebecca replied as she lifted a brow. I'm giving you word as a mother and a grandmother and a great grandmother. This is a true and real that is home. This home is for EB2. Feel safe for her and her son. For her to find peace so long as she wants to be on Welsh Park Island. Thank you, Rebecca. Really, I do appreciate it. Evie answered quickly, blocking any more toxicity from her mother's clear skepticism. Uh, Rebecca smiled uh, and got up. Let's see, make sure I get there right. Evie did too. After a quick, awkward beat, Rebecca reached over. And hugged Evie. Please let me know if you need anything, Rebecca said as she turned to Aurora to say said to goodbye. Aurora politely turned to goodbye, and when Rebecca opened the revealing the steel stone like Aurora Aaron Hampstead, she quickly grabbed his arm and went back down the stairs to their waiting car. Do not go do not go into that house, Aurora said as Evie closed the door. I urge you, Evie, do not go there. Evie sighed and stared at the four keys in her hand. They represented her own freedom, but at the same time, she knew her mother, Aurora, has reason to worry. Was this beach finally her piece of the Lord family pie, or was it a devious trap by a queen of the, of the family herself? At Welshport uh, Hope Hospital across town, uh, Dr. Shia Hoffman worked on her office looking over paperwork, but her mind was not on her work. Her mind was on the awful thing she had helped Gregory Reigns with. Not only had she helped hide the child Aurora, uh, gave birth to the adopt to and adopted him to Mary and Philip, but she had also helped beef up the lie to Aurora. The child had died. Aurora, believing she gave birth to a stillborn girl, never knew her child was a boy and a lie. To make <clears throat> matters worse. Nick, as she is partner that she adored, and Aurora's son overheard the secret being revealed, unbeknownst to as she and Gregory. Nothing could keep as she is attentions on her work. Uh, of all guilty consequences, or sorry, consciences and mind pushing her to a place she hated. She had promised Nick that she'd never keep secrets again, as she did in the past. Now, because of Gregory calling in a favor to her, she was kiving to the biggest secret and lie she had ever helped crap. 
Lovecraft. Being a child who was also adopted made it hurt even more. Despite the child's father conceiving while being under the control of a demon inside Caspian, the baby did deserve to live with its real parents. Ashia knew this. She knew that Gregory's jealousy, Gregory's jealousy and worry of Caspian's connection to Aurora, their child together, didn't necessarily mean Aurora would leave him for Caspian, and it didn't mean that Aurora would suffer more pains being this child's mother. Those were Gregory's own self con consciousness of selfish thoughts. And yet, she was trapped. She owed Gregory to, for protecting her. Lie about that man who called her father. That lie was the spider that trapped her in Gregory's web. As she shuffled her papers, unable, unable to connect to, to her work, she suddenly heard a faint cry. She stopped her shuffling and listened, her hazel eyes fixed on the corner of the room as she were in a trance, unable to be released. Then the sound became more and more clear. It was in the room. This cry, she could hear it better and better as the seconds passed. As she just stood up from the great oak desk and sat behind, that she sat behind. Uh, her dark hair slipped from its perch, her shoulders, and dropped to the center of her back like a long carpet. A black and brown silk. She listened closely again to the sound. It was a baby crying. She didn't believe it at first. She chuckled, realizing how tired she might be. But then the sound grew louder, then softer, then louder, and louder, then suddenly quiet. Then again, the cry would come taunting her over and over again. But she felt as if she were being surrounded haunted the voice of a child calling to her reminding her of what she did who she did it to and evil how evil it truly was the cry came again where where is it she said to herself uh, out loud quickly rushing from her desk into the four large cabinets to her feet frantically opening the them to find out only clutter, extra white coats, and more and more paperwork. The baby's voice grew louder. Where are you? Where are you? As she has scratched her screeched her voice echoing up into the high ceilings of her old of her old hospital. She began to tear up uh tear open drawers, sorry, and flip over tables and pull out sofa cushions desperately searching for his this phantom baby who would not stop crying it's not real as she has said to herself as she slumped to the floor her arms clinging to the top of her office sofa but the child's cry did not vanish she began to feel as if her office walls were closing in she jumped in from the window her left foot snagging on the front hem of her long blue dress yank, yanking her down to the floor where she banged her head on the hardwood flaps of her office floor the baby's cry got louder and louder stop it stop it she screamed out loud the baby's cry began to I, I can't do it um, the one guy from season of the witch, uh, began to laugh, um, a wicked baby's laugh, he, it, he chilled as she to the bone, the taunting cry, the taunting baby's laugh, it was calling to her to make her mad, she knew she was losing her mind, she couldn't grasp her normal life any longer, 
Which yellow goose took her mind away from her crimes. Nick could not save her from herself, and she could not, would not allow this to go on any longer. Uh, she had to tell the man she loved what she had done to his half sibling and where he was. She could not allow herself to fall deeper into whatever go ridden burden was slowly beginning to was over her as the days went on. It didn't matter what Gregory planned to do in retaliation. She had to be honest. She jumped up from the floor and a slight bump on her forehead aching as she reached the door pulled it open only to find Gregory standing there with his in a bell ready to knock. He quickly noticed the frantic expression all over her face and did not hesitate to wonder why. Are you okay? He asked her, testing her. What are you doing here? She asked her nervous now on it her ner nerves now on edge. Dr. Hoffman, you do not look well. What happened? Gregory asked, knowing she'd already been questioning their crime for weeks. But she didn't answer and pulled him into the, her office that was thrown into chaos. And what's happened here? Gregory asked, worried things were about to fall apart between the two conspirators. They cried again, and she is mine. She went, and if it were a knife slicing through her head, is she what's going on? What's, what happened here? Gregory asked again, trying to keep calm. I don't think I can do this anymore, Gregory. We have to tell Aurora if I keep this or Nick any longer. I think I'm going to she pause. Do what, is she? What are you planning to do? Uh, Gregory interrupted. I just want to have... I just have to tell Nicholas, maybe he'll agree with us. Maybe he'll think we did the right thing by taking the de that demon's baby from Aurora and giving him a home that he could sure he could raise him without the stigma. Maybe he'll help us, as she explained. Uh, no, Gregory shouted. I knew this was going to happen. That's why I came. I had to make sure you were all right after our last conversation. I didn't feel confident that our plan would stay in, in one piece. And now I see that I was right. The minute you tell Nick anything, everything we planned to keep Aurora safe from whatever the child could be is gone. Where are you going? When are you going to understand? Is she that this was the best thing we could have done for any? I don't believe that, as she replied. We took a child away from its mother and told her it died. A child conceived by a man possessed by the devil. Aurora didn't deserve to be saddled with, down with. Suddenly, as she sushed very and since it stopped crying, she said softly as she, there was no one crying. It's in your head. Your mind is playing tricks with you. Gregory said, no, no, no. It was loud. I heard it as I hear your voice. It was real. A sign this child is telling me we did, what we did was not right. We have to correct it. Gregor, we have to. Ashia, you're worrying me. I don't want to have to do what I said I'd do if this all fell apart. If I tell everyone that you lied about Andrew Kim being the man who shot Jacob and Christian Evans two years ago, you'll go away for to prison for lying. I'll show them the evidence you fraudulently claimed was real. Everyone will believe that I was duped just as much as they were by a woman who sought 
vengeance for her father's death, Kim will go free. And you'll be taken away from here. Your work and Nicholas, you can't want that, can you? Gregory said, stepping closer and closer to her, Ashia fell the threat as if it were a noose around her neck. Tightening, she could see he was dangling her freedom in front of her, the carrot to her rabbit. But she didn't want to continue to keep the secret, not this blind anyway. You have to understand that what we did was cruel, and I'm worried Nicholas may already know if she had confessed. Uh, if he already knew, don't you think he would... Made it obvious for grass. The baby cried again softly, this time as if it were two rooms away. As she looked off toward her right shoulder, where the crowd was coming from, distracted from the conversation, Gregory sighed. His frustrations growing more and more, with his partner slowly breaking mind. Ashia he shouted as he clapped his hands to get her attention. She turned to back him, the baby's cry vanishing in the sound of the clap. She did not say anything back to Gregory. She only stared at him with water welling up in her eyes. Gregory knew now that things would slowly get out of line if Ashia was already this fragile. He had to make sure she was trying to keep his tie uh, locked away and the only way he could was to make sure she herself was kept locked away. Locked away. Uh, he had to take action. Gregory smirked kindly, yet like a cat that ate the canary, he pulled the crack she into his arms for a hug. He held her tightly like a big brother. She had slowly begun to see him as a as and kissed her on the head. Don't worry, he said softly. What are we going to do? She asked, her face buried in his chest. I'll take care of everything. No one will ever know, he said cryptically. You'll tell Aurora and Nick but say I had nothing to do with it, she asked foolishly. He confirmed her question, saying he'd do what he needed to be done. She hugged him tightly, believing that this meant he'd protect her and also tell the truth. But in real recollection of the window of her office, the cold stare of a man shined on the glass. Uh, he adopted Aurora more than anything on he adored uh or more than anything on the planet. The love he had for her felt like an undying fire that burned deep in his body and no one would would it extinguish. Not a chill by another man that to Gregory threatened his relationship stability and not this slowly breaking down co-conspirator's guilt. Conscious Gregory's eyes had no feeling now. They only reflected the cold hearted desire to keep what he wanted, no matter who was hurt. Uh, as is she is refreshed in Gregory, um, Crying, uh, she was she winched in pain, hoping the crying would be die down. But the only thing that m might die soon was the mentally frail doctor hearing the phantom cry of a child she kept. She felt good. Um. Later that afternoon, Evie and Nicholas arrived. Uh, by taxi to 
medium cliffside mansion overlooking the Atlantic Ocean with a clear view of the horizon. It seemed to go on and on, just blue sea and sky. The wind was strong this evening, and dust was only hours away as they stood there staring up at Belmore House on the beach. Evie felt as if she was finally home, her home. Are you sure you want to do this? Be here, Nick asked, unsure of the idea of Evie being alone in such a remote home. The east of the island was a good one. Evie smiled and lifted her arm onto her brothers and began to pull him up the stony path. Oh, come on, you worry, Lord. Evie slipped the key and the lock uh, and pushed the front door open. Uh, the salty smell of the old sea air rushed her. Uh, she and Nick entered the house to find the furniture in the very first room covered in white sheets and patches of fl fluffy dust. This was a simplicity, simplicity to the home. Uh, comfortable in its pale blue walls with white painted border, the golden varnished hardwood floors still shined as if they were new. Uh, the chandelier in the foyer hung like an upside down umbrella, sparkling in the evening glow. It's actually really adorable, she said, staring up at, into the rafters. Gabriel will be very happy here. So you really trust Rebecca in helping you get Gabriel back then. Nick asked, already up to speed in the latest family drama. She promised. And if Rebecca Lord does anything, it's keep her promises. Nick nodded. I'll do what I can to to make sure she does too. I would have for all of this to be some sort of trick of hers or something Jacob and Celeste cocked up to trap you. Mommy was quite sure it was something like that, he said. Nikki, Mummy might be going a bit overboard on that, but she means well. Evie added looking around her new home. We could reach out to her. Lear, too, maybe he can think of something legally to switch things up on Jacob with Celeste, you know, legally keeping Rebecca out of it. Having her get into the mix in any way may be our determinant to the court, Nick said. Detriment, he means. Evie shook her head. Absolutely not. He's the family lawyer. Last thing we would do is go against his own family, especially after he's one who filed the paperwork in the first place. If Rebecca isn't able to convince Jacob and Celeste to do the right thing and give me back my child, I'll think of other ways to do it. I've learned a lot since I've been on Welshport. No one is going to take advantage of me anymore. Nick suddenly realized his sister was not who she was when she left London almost four years ago. It was, in a way, a bittersweet change in her personality. She was beginning to stand up for herself and fight back, but at a, the cost of her sweet innocence. D.B. Jordan that left London would never have never felt the need to find other avenues of getting what she wanted. But at the same time, she was doing the best she could to keep her family together, and Nick admired that in his big sister. Sebastian would have loved to live here again with us, Evie noted. I bet he would. I'll admit it. He's really, it's really magical here, Evie. About Sebastian, do you ever want to talk about what happened? About the medication I prescribed? And Nick asked, hoping to clear the air about his involvement in her almost dying. Evie interrupted, Nikki, stop. I know you didn't do anything that caused what happened to me. I know that for a fact. You never hurt me, and I want you to just tell, let any, or sorry, let any guilt about what happened go away. 
but it wasn't but if it wasn't for me you'd be you would have never she interrupted again I said I don't blame you believe me she replied with a s warm smile she was telling the truth the blame was squirrely on the mysterious Jacqueline Gray the witch who caused all of this pain and Evie's near death deep inside a grave, but fearing the lords would once again lock her in an insane asylum for such a wild story of witches and spells, Evie kept all it all a secret from her family, and so far it seemed to eat to it seemed to Evie that Jacqueline was long gone, vanished from Evie's life once and thankfully for all. Hey look at this the now relieved Nikki said, removing a sheet that clung over frame photo. It was a small 4x4 four four photo of Sebastian as a child. With a silver frame, the boy sat on a horse on the beach. The edges of the photo inside the frame were frayed and old. The color was already darkened by age, but it was Sebastian. His eyes are the same, Evie said happily, are the same. Nick questioned with an eyebrow up, where she replied quickly. Where is he, Evie? Nick quickly asked. Evie turned to her brother and huffed. She had told no... She told everyone that Sebastian had saved her, but no one really believed her. They all thought she had hallucinated him digging her up out of the grave, but by the evidence of her nails, all the dirt on her when she arrived back at Terramore seemed to them she miraculously dug herself out, and the lack of oxygen had only created Sebastian's image. To everyone else in the world, Sebastian was long dead from the explosion long ago at Lockwood Thicket. Nick, on the other hand, never ever second-guessed his big sister. If Evie and Sebastian was, if Evie said Sebastian was alive and saved her, he was. What, she replied coyly, he's nowhere, he's gone. She had it playing along with what everyone else believed. Now, now, you're talking to me here. Go on, tell me, Nick said. Evie turned to her brother and saw his sweet face, his trusting eyes. He, his loving acceptance of whatever she would tell him was true, was true. He's safe somewhere where no one can hurt him, she sighed. Not society, not Jacob, not Jacqueline Gray, she answered as... She yanked down the sheets over the se several of the paintings on the wall. You know what everyone thinks, don't you? Nick asked. They think you dreamed it up. It all up. Well, let them think that I know that. I know the truth. And now you do too. Besides, Nicky, I don't care what everyone thinks. You know me better that than that, she said it grinning. Right, I do, but still, he answered, apparently, I just want to be sure after everything that's happened, we're going to be okay here, and if Sebastian is out there, then we have to be sure you'll be safe from him. Nick, Sebastian won't hurt me. He won't hurt anyone at any time. He's not what you think. I know it's hard to believe. I know it's hard to accept that after what he did to you at the thicket, I feel the same way too, but when he saved me, we connected again. Together, we made the decision to finally put some him somewhere where no one could, could look, and he could move on, and so could Gabriel and I. It's going to be that way forever, he and I agreed. Nick decided to drop the subject. As hard as it was for him to believe Sebastian was alive and that he helped Evie out of the grave where she was buried, Evie was firm in her vision of events. Events that were true, 
but to the rest of the world, but to the rest of the world were too wild to believe. As Evie made her way through the new, or sorry, her new home, she hoped would soon include her baby boy. She went over to a large group of windows and pulled the drapes back, revealing a large burn of that overlooked the rocky shore below. She stepped out into the veranda and leaned on the ledge, watching the waves crash below in the rocks. She could feel the vibrations of the water bash, bashing like bombs deep in her chest. She closed her eyes and looked, took in a deep breath of cool ocean air, and when she opened them again, down below on a small patch of sandy beach, she saw a man walking. She squinted her eyes. She recognized him. She knew who he was. But how? How could it be? Matthew, she said to herself as Nikki exited the house and joined her on the verse since. What? he asked, hearing her say his old friend's name. Look down there, Evie answered, pointing to the beach. Is it really him? How? Nick asked. It's Matthew. That's Matthew, Evie said joyfully, remembering the man she once loved, Sebastian, and who had supposedly been lost at sea. But his ship, his ship sank months ago, Nick exclaimed. It's him, Nick. It's really him. Matthew is alive. Evie rushed from the ba balcony that overlooked the sea and dashed through Belmore House, the living room, and its furniture covered in white sheets. Evie Nick shouted at her from the door as the sky finally showed signs of settling the this, this setting sun. Wait, she was like a woman gone mad. She couldn't believe her eyes. She desperately needed to see the man uh, down on the beach was Matthew Winterborn, a long lost Love it. Long lost. Her long lost sea fiance. She ran down a dirt path. Evie ran and she ran. She heard the bashing waves <coughs> grow louder. And finally, she climbed over the sharp black rocks and got to the sand and threw her. Shoes off, she ran toward the beach. There he was standing there, taking a long, deep breath of sea air as the night came. Nick stood at the top of the cliffs and watched in awe of his sister. Matthew, she said, as the waves crashed on the beach. He turned Matthew's eyes wide. There she was, a woman from his memories, when he woke up peeking into real life. He walked over to her almost as if he would, was afraid she was some kind of memory again, a phantom of what he wanted to see, but she was real. Matthew, is it really you? She asked, the water washing over her bare feet. He smiled politely, unsure of what to answer, as his memory was still foggy. I think so, he answered. His voice was proof enough. Evie yelped like a schoolgirl and jumped into his arms. As the sun set behind them, bathing them in an orange light that filtered through her hair like golden rays of sunshine, as the spring air quickly clicked into summer. Sure, we got everything there. Okay. As night fell, Caroline Taylor was putting Gabriel to bed. They had a very good day of sign learning and for being such a young boy. Gable was picking up the very basic ways to communicate quiet quickly. Cora was pleased with his progress and hoped that the little boy was hearing. Moss would soon be able to speak perfectly with his hands. Now we just have to get your family up to speed, Cora whispered to his the sleeping toddler. Cora Celeste said softly from the little boy's bedroom door. 
car walked over. Yes, Miss Lord. She whispered Celeste, motioned for her to follow her into the upstairs parlor where they could chat. In the dimly lit room, they sat on face they sat on facing blue sofas and Celeste poured her some evening tea. How is he doing? she asked. He's learning quickly, thankfully, in a few years I suspect he'll be teaching us new signs for words, Cora said, graciously taking the tea. That's wonderful news. You've done an amazing job. We're all very thankful of you, Celeste replied. I also wanted to get your opinion on something. Oh, now that his mother is back, do you feel that keeping the boy from her would harm him? He would slow his progress in learning, Celeste wondered, showing a glimmer of guilt. For taking your show well it's hard to say carolyn answered i'm not a psychologist but i can tell you being with a nat i can tell you that being with its natural mother would do wonders for him that's true for any child can i tell you something something that you'll keep between you and i celeste asked carolyn I, of course miss lord jacob and i be I feel we've made a bad choice taking Gable from Evie so quickly. Maybe we Jacob acted on impulse instead of, I guess, well, I'll say it, integrity. Maybe I need some reassurance for someone who's been close to him, like you have, to see if he's affecting him in any way. Of course it could affect him, but how those effects will develop, but... Over time, I can't say again. I'm not a psychologist, Cora replied. Would you advise we drop the guardianship? Celeste asked. To Cora, the answer was simple. Yes, but she knew what her first job was. She was there under cover for her sleazy brother, the investigative reporter, Baxter Murphy. He wanted dirt on the family. He thrived on dysfunctional tendencies, bad behaviors. He wanted to do be the one to take down the most powerful family on the eastern seaboard and Cora was tasked to do it for him. Her conscience told her to tell Celeste it was the best to give Gabriel back. Her allegiance to her brother spoke first. I think you did the right thing, Cora said, the words burning her lips with lies. You do? Celeste asked in surprise. Um... Uh, well, we don't know how stable Evie is, do we? After all, the woman was buried in a grave, and she said some witch or something put her there, and that her dead husband came and dug her up. Cora said, surprised and Celeste. Cora Celeste said, pushing, pausing after B. How did you know that? Cora then realized she gave her eavesdropping self away. Oh, I I'm sorry. I know what it looks like, Mrs. Lord, but I wasn't personally listening. I just, I just heard as I passed the room. I see Celeste replied with an eyebrow lift. Well, as I was saying, something has to be wrong with her. So yes, yes, I might feel like you and Mr. Lord did what was best for Gabriel. Cora replied, hesitating what, while she spoke, as the lies continued to flow. Celeste smiled back, her training as a, as a good wife of Lord settling nicely, but her unease with Cora now revealing she's a bit of a eavesdropper didn't sit well. Thank you for your opinion, Caroline, Celeste replied slightly bridged in tone. Cora couldn't stand herself. She felt sick for lying. She knew Evie was indeed capable of taking care of her own son. She felt that any mental unease Evie went through all, over the last few months were all products of intense stress and grief over being put in a mental institution by Jacob and Celeste. And that whatever she imagined after being buried alive was also a product of that stress and, of course, lack of air. There were logical explanations to Evie's version of events, Carol, Cora believed, but she had to keep up appearances for Baxter, and she had to report back to him. 
to Korra there were cracks in Celeste's vineyard and perhaps there would be a division to come between Jacob's plots and schemes and Celeste's willingness to go along. Korra knew this information would be pay dirt to begin to break the Lord family once and for all, but she, she had no idea if they if by then she'd have the stomach to keep going along with Baxter sneaking. So that's the read along. Uh, a lot of great character development in this. I really. It was shocking to see, not necessarily Rebecca give them the keys, but Evie accept it. But Evie. I wonder if Evie's actually going to plan something. Because that's what the sense I get from this. Now, I could be wrong, so don't take my word for it. Don't, don't listen to me. Uh, but do go check out this story. Uh, link to Be Night and Begone but just will be in the description box. Really, 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 really good. Uh, i got to read the next chapter. I'm not going to read that tonight. I'll read that tomorrow. See you guys.